Are you ready, Belle? I'm ready. Well, I want to welcome everybody to this evening's amazing talk with the ever popular Belle Gender Joker. Uh, Belle, what is our um, topic this evening? Oh, I'll just share my screen if that's okay. Well, no, not yet. Oh, okay. Our topic is abnormal blood sugars and diabetic control. Excellent. Thank you. Um, that was Belle a test, wasn't is... it? Make sure I had the right presentation. <laughs> uh. That's right. So everyone knows, probably everyone knows that Val is a uh, part of our uh, IHN continuing education uh, programming. Val used to teach in the diploma program and he is a very sought after uh, individual. And now he teaches twice a year, the uh, supplementation in clinical practice. We're always full. And that's there. There's my uh, plug. Uh, it's a fantastic course. So my name is Julia Rickard. I have been at IHN for about 14 years now. Love every minute. I do the co-op placement program, the continuing education series, uh, and faculty for professional practice. And I'm so thrilled to be here to introduce Bell Gender. And he is going to lead us through um, a little bit more about uh, who Bell is, uh, the talk, and then be as amazing as he usually is. So Bell, throwing to you. Okay, well, um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, looks like there's a, holy smokes, well over 20 people. Good job, Julia. I'm going to just actually share my screen for you guys so you see what I see. Now I just have to go do some stupid thing here. Bear with me. I lost something. There we go. Okay. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for IHN for putting this uh, webinar on. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, abnormal blood sugars and associated complications. So not just the actual blood sugar diabetes stuff, but, you know, we know there's a lot of other issues associated with it. So we want to be also looking at the complications uh, associated to diabetes. And uh, we're going to be looking at, of course, supplementation on how to go about supporting your patient's health um, with whatever else they might be doing lifestyle-wise, medication-wise, we're going to look at supplementation that can actually support everything to make the whole process easier, better quality of life, and so on. Okay? So, really quickly, uh, actually, before we go, just in case somebody missed, uh, tonight's uh, webinar is going to be done a little bit different than what you're normally used to doing. Um, as... Um, Everybody actually has access to their mic. Please keep it off. Um, I will ask you if you want to ask a question. I do not want it typed up because I don't want to read it. I want everybody then to put their hand up if they have a question. And then I will call your name out when I have finished my train of thought. Otherwise, I'll forget where it was. That happens a lot. And then... <laughs> um, you can open your mic up, ask a question, turn your mic off, put your hand down, and then we will continue on with the lecture. We're going to try to still keep this within an hour um, so that everybody asks the question. It doesn't, no, nobody's asking the same question over and over again. That's what I found that happens with the chats. So I want to avoid that. You ask a question, everybody gets the same answer. Five other people might have wanted, uh, wanted the answer anyways, so everybody gets it. So this is actually how I do my teaching. Um, I find it to be most relevant that way. Um, and that's what I want to do for you guys tonight. Uh, so we're going to try this out. Uh, Julie's going to try this out. Hopefully it works well. Just remember to keep your mic off until I call your name. So me, uh, Belgian Deshoker. So I, I've been a naturopathic consultant for over 20 years. Um, I finished the four-year program at CCNM. I was a faculty member. I currently am the national educator for BioLorenco, Dr. Reckwood Homeopathics, where I do trainings, webinars, talks, and so on um, to practitioners and retail um, at shows. I've done talks, things like that. Um, and I, for some reason, have taught anatomy physiology at IHN. That's what Julia alluded to. I don't know why I did that, but I did. And currently, I teach a supplementation clinical practice course. And really, 
We're here to see an excerpt of that tonight on blood sugar balancing diabetic control from the actual course. So you have also, you'll have good information on helping your patients with diabetic control. And also you see what my course is kind of set up as uh, on top of that. Okay. So um, again, I want to thank you guys for being here. Let's get started. First of all, every man takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits of the world. What we are taught at school is a small bit of what we really need to know. And I want to thank you guys for being here because you're going beyond your, you can say, the limits that you've been taught, all right, and your field of vision. You're trying to expand your field of vision and going beyond what you normally would know of to help your patients, help yourself, whatever it is. And it's crucial that you keep learning. So these continued courses that uh, IHN puts on, it's very important for you to learn that. Uh, the continued courses and webinars that companies put on, it's important to go out and listen to those so you expand your knowledge and it will help you in your practice and in what you do on a regular basis. Very important. Don't be closed-minded. Don't be just stuck in one way of doing something. Learn the other stuff. You may not need to use it, but there will be a time when you can say, oh, wow, yes, this actually makes some good sense here. So expand your knowledge. Very important. And we're going to expand your knowledge tonight about diabetes. Okay. Um, so what is it? First of all, when the, body, when the body loses its ability to produce or properly use the insulin. So it can't produce the insulin or it's not using it properly. That's the general definition of diabetes. It leads to a reduced quality of life. You can get heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, and so on and so on. We'll see all of that shortly, okay? And there are three main types of diabetes, type one, type two, and gestational diabetes. Type one, type two, not gonna be a concern for us tonight. We're gonna really be focusing on type, uh, sorry, type one and gestational, not a concern. We're gonna be focused on type two tonight, okay? So just a brief on the other one, so you know what they are, type one diabetes, it's an autoimmune condition where the insulin producing cells of the pancreas are getting destroyed. So we need external source of insulin, usually diagnosed in childhood or adolescence. Gestational diabetes occurs in pregnant women. And generally it will disappear after the delivery, but not always. It can actually then lead to type two if it's not well managed. But the one we're going to be concerned with and that we can do something about is type 2 diabetes. Okay. It's a metabolic, metabolic disorder where the pancreas does not produce enough insulin. So it's producing, but just not, not, not enough for the body to fully do what it needs to do with the sugar. And also the body does not properly use the insulin that's produced. So it could be either or, or both of those conditions associated with it, with the individual. Okay. It's so usually people who are overweight or obese, physically inactive, certain ethnic origins, and who have a family history of diabetes or um, who are at risk. In fact, that's me. Um, eh, my kid calls me overweight. I'm definitely not physically active. <laughs> I am of that ethnic origin and I have a family history of diabetes. Okay. But I also say that I got a family history of heart and cholesterol. So it kind of balances both those out. So I don't think I have any of them. I'm hoping, but we'll see. How can you avoid wetting your shoes when you frequently walk on the riverside? This is the pathology of chronic disease. If you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, it's only going to get worse. You're never going to make something better. And diabetes is one of these things that if you keep your lifestyle the way it is, which is usually bad for most people, if you keep your diet the way it is, which is usually bad for these people, right? Then you are going to lead down this path. You have to change somewhere if you want to reverse it, okay? So you have to basically stop and reverse 
what you're going to be doing. Otherwise, you're in a chronic state because diabetes type 2 is a chronic progressive condition that is generally lifestyle related, which means we can actually prevent this thing from happening. Or you can actually reverse it if it's done right. Now, you may not completely get rid of it. You might still be on some sort of medication, but you can truly support it and avoid that medication from getting worse and higher and higher levels in the body too. Okay. So typically appears in adults older than 40. It can be in younger people because of the poor lifestyle that, you know, happens along with the high stress, so on. But if it's left untreated or or improperly, uh, improperly managed, it can result in heart disease, kidney disease, eye disease, problems with erection, and of course, nerve damage. That's the chronic and progressive nature. Starts with poor insulin control, but now it's affecting the whole body down the line. That's the progressive condition of this thing. So we want to actually help control both the progressive nature of this and bring out again, get rid of the chronic nature of this because it's just going to get worse if you do not. Quick stats for you. In 2017, so that's what, about four years ago, 7% of Canadians age 12 and older were reported being diagnosed with diabetes. Okay. Over a one-year span, 2016, 2017, all right, increased from 7.6 to 8.4. That's for men. It actually increased in that time. But diabetes increases with age for males. Uh, usually really bad, uh, you know, at highest one, they're about 75 and older. And percentage of females reporting diabetes increased with age from uh, the lower age of seven, uh, 64. All right. Now, here's the thing. Those age 18 and older who were overweight or obese were more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. Two things that can be actually managed well, the overweight and obese nature. Uh, Ten-year span, from 2003 to 2013, the people diagnosed with diabetes went from 5.6% to 7.8%. That's an almost a 40% increase over a 10-year span, 40% increase in diabetics uh, being diagnosed. And it's only going to get worse, as we know, because if they're not making healthy lifestyle changes, it's just going to get worse overall. Uh, just the same thing, basically, in a chart, 10-year span, a little bit earlier, uh, from 99 to 2009. You see the numbers going up 3.3% all the way to 5.6%. And the previous slide showed increase again, which means we're on an upward trend no matter what. And here's probably the kicker. Prevalence of diabetes among individuals from 20 to 79 years uh, amongst the countries. USA, number one. All right, this is a percentage. Portugal and Canada is number three. Back in 2010, we were number three. That's how bad the lifestyle is, you can say, for people. All right. Number three in the world. Not a good number to have. Uh, testing for diabetes. There's three tests that uh, can normally be done. And people will come to you with some report, usually, and saying, here's my blood work. Uh, what does it tell me? What do I need to do? Well, there's the fasting glucose, which is usually checked when you don't eat anything for eight. Usually it's about 12 hours. Okay. And you want to see something less than seven because anything seven or more is indicative of diabetes. Random blood glucose. Most don't usually do this unless they're a diabetic. Uh, test results of 11 or greater, and regardless of when you eat plus symptoms of diabetes indicates diabetes. And then really the fasting glucose and the HA1C are normally what's done on blood work. And the HA1C is a three month control of your blood sugar levels. And if it's 
above 6.5 indicates diabetes. Fasting glucose 7 indicates diabetes. HA1C three-month control 6.5 indicates diabetes. So we want to see the numbers around the 5 range, usually no issues whatsoever around there. 4 to 5 is the ideal place to keep your blood sugar levels if you can. It is easier to suppress, and I'll use the word prevent instead. So it is easier to prevent evil at the start and more difficult as it grows because people ignore the small, they suffer by the large. This is the progression of pathology. If we catch it early, we can control, manage, reverse, whatever, much quicker. But people don't come to you at the beginning stages is the problem. They let things build up, they keep going and going and going. And when all of a sudden it's affecting their lifestyle, which means they're suffering by the large, that's when they come looking for help. Well, it's a long road back. You can let them know. All right. If they came much earlier, we can manage this with probably like a half an hour walk a day and you don't have to do anything else. But now you're going to go on medication, you're going to do supplementation, you're going to have to eat right, and on top of it, you're going to have to exercise tenfold, right? So this is the issue with people is that they let things get out of hand, and they only seek help when it's truly affecting their lifestyle. And this isn't just with diabetes, this is with practically every condition out there, okay? You will see this. And then they expect you to work miracles. Good luck is actually the word you use for, with them, the phrase, okay? Good luck. You let it go on for years, and it's going to take a long time to get you back the other way, all right? And it's going to take a lot of work. So you want to let your clients, your uh, patients, everybody know that, hey, let's deal with things as they come, not when they really go on and compound over the whole time and make things worse. Really important, that communication, so you can work with them much faster and hit everything as it's coming. Then that way they can do what they want to do, which is live life without any hindrance of any kind. Symptoms of type 2 diabetes. General symptoms include fatigue, frequent urination, Unusual thirst, unexplained weight loss. In type 1 diabetes, symptoms are the same, but they progress quickly and more and often are more dramatic. So in type 2, they're slower to progress. But the issue, again, with dealing with something when it's coming on versus leaving it and then dealing with it as it gets worse. Progressive diabetes causes blindness, reduced blood supply to the limbs, leading to amputation, lots of nerve damage and erectile dysfunction, right? All that can be avoided if they took care of it early. Cost of two, uh, type two diabetes, heavy healthcare cost. Um, and it says 2022, believe me, it's a lot longer than that, okay? Um, predicted 10-year risk of developing diabetes for Canadians. Uh, this was from 2011, okay, from 2011, was 10%. That's 2.16 million new cases. From 2012 to 2022, they're predicting a 10% increase in the population. Total healthcare cost over fifteen billion dollars in that time. Okay, over fifteen billion from the ten-year span that they were looking at here is what they're predicting the cost to be. I'm pretty sure it's higher than that. Complications of type two diabetes, short-term and long-term complications, usually related to uh, vascular conditions, macro and microvascular conditions. Okay, and other things, infections, wound slow, uh, slow wound healing, and diabetic ketoacidosis. But the other ones that we've already talked about that impact the quality of life: cardiovascular disease, cholesterol issues, eye disease, which means diabetic retinopathy, cataracts, glaucoma, kidney disease, 
nerve damage, big time. Okay, lower extremity complications and including amputation, complications during pregnancy, preterm birth, uh, or even a large newborn depression, oral disease, gingivitis, periodontitis, okay, and of course, mental illness. These are all complications associated with diabetes. Risk factors. Over 40, being overweight, family member having it already, having gestational diabetes puts you at risk. Having given birth to a baby that weighs more than nine pounds puts you at risk. Somebody who has high blood pressure, higher cholesterol, all right, and a member of a high-risk ethnic group. There's a whole list of those, okay? How to minimize the risk factors. Stop smoking. Get your proper weight. So act, be active. Do exercise. Watch your diet. Have regular meals. And maintain proper blood pressure and cholesterol. So it's all easy to say, all right? But if somebody is not doing majority of that stuff, it is hard to turn someone's lifestyle around to be able to do, get them healthy. It takes time. Not everybody is gung-ho about doing everything at once when their whole life revolves them around them doing half of that stuff so that's over there. It's hard to change everything around. A physician is ob obligated to consider more than a diseased organ, more even than the whole man. He must view the man in his world, All right? There's the disease, and then there's the patient. The disease is just a label that the Western medical society likes to uh, put on people so they know how to pigeonhole them and treat them with particular medications if they can, or surgery, or whatever it is. But there's a patient in front of you. Okay, there's not a disease in front of you. There's a patient in front of you. That person has diabetes. That's a disease. That's a label. But that person also has, all right, all these other things going on, all this stuff. All right. So you have to deal with that person that's in front of you. All right. And that involves everything associated with that person, their lifestyle, right, their eating habits, their work. Um, their stress levels, their sleep pattern, you know, what's, what kind of things are they exposed to? You have to look at everything if you actually truly want to help that person out and get them to heal. So your goals of treatment. Of course, you're going to try to improve insulin production, okay, so that we're releasing better insulin from the pancreas, all right, uh, in response to what the blood uh, glucose levels are after eating. We want to increase the sens insulin sensitivity. We want to improve cellular glucose utilization, the uptake of it, right? We want to reduce all the diabetic complications. We want to support the nerve function, reduce and support cravings and hypoglycemia, and treat any associated symptoms. And then again, we have to deal with the stress of this person too, all right, on top of that. So there's a lot of things to do. Now, you can't do everything at once. This is stuff you're going to work through. Right, along with, as I said, they're probably on medication. So, the types of medication number one is metformin. Anybody who's got diabetes is practically on metformin, whether they're on 500 milligrams once a day, three times a day, a thousand milligrams three times a day, just depends how out of control it is. Uh, Genuvia is another. Um, uh, commonly given medication. So, you know, there's different types and what they do. So if somebody's on a particular form of medication, it gives you an idea of what you're going to be thinking of supplementation wise, if you're going to give them some supplementation as to where you need to target. Okay. Because if, if they're on metformin and that's all they're on, what's it do? It works by making your body respond better to the insulin. So therefore, it helps lower the glucose production from the uh, liver. So you want to now think about, okay, how do we help the insulin uh, utilization? If they're on the second line, 
works to lower blood glucose by increasing insulin levels after meals. So that's different from better response to the insulin. Then you have to look at what you can do with the pancreas. So that's what the medications. So look at what the properties of the medication are to narrow down what you have to do for that patient. All right. Ah, the cell is immortal. It is merely the fluid in which it floats that degenerates. Renew this fluid at regular intervals. Give the cell what, uh, what they require for nutrition. And as far as we know, the pulsation of life can go on forever. That's the importance of nutrition. Food, nutrients. If we provide what the body needs, it will heal itself but it's a matter of figuring out what the body needs, right? So if, if you can narrow it down and you can really figure out where the deficiencies are, and there's usually not just one, there's many. And that's why, as I said, it's not a disease that you're taking care of. It's that person. But the uh, nutrition is going to be the most important thing that you're going to be looking at. Feeding the body what it needs for its energy cycles and everything else. Okay, this is where the supplementation comes in. So again, uh, anybody who's joined us right now, okay, don't know, um, you are all muted at the moment. Good. Uh, if you have a question, please put raise your hand. When I'm finished my train of thought, I will call out your name. You can unmute and ask your question. Then mute yourself, take your hand down, and we will continue from that point on. So supplementation wise. Um, some of the most simplest stuff that you need to know that, you know, at the beginning stages, this might be more than enough. Um, there's three things I, I you want to know about the most basic things. And you want to know these because they're practically going to be in all the formulas we're going to look at shortly. Okay. Chromium, vanadium, and alpha lipoic acid, all important for blood sugar uh, um, balancing. They all have a different function in the body also. So chromium, I think everybody knows about chromium for blood sugar balancing, uh, whether it's high or low, whatever. And, and if they got, again, diabetes, you name it, you're going to be providing some sort of chromium into the mix. Why? Critical role in the human system's glucose tolerance factor structure. It's responsible for balancing blood sugar insulin levels. And it's the transportation system for glucose. Uh, so therefore, having the uptake effect of that sugar, circulating sugar, into the cells for fuel. That's what it's doing. Vanadium. It has the ability to mimic the function of insulin. So therefore, it has an anabolic and stimulating effect in the body. Mimicking what insulin can do. Okay, versus before helping the sugar get up into the cells better. Alpha lipoic acid is unique. It's water and fat soluble antioxidant. It helps with the mitochondrial electron transport reactions. So more energy production within the body. It's a very potent antioxidant. So cellular healing on top of that. You know, it goes hand in hand with CoQ10, vitamin C, vitamin E, and all these other antioxidants that really support the cleansing of the body and more uh, cellular transport within the body. So these things are going to be crucial. Uh, and whether you do them single or you do them uh, in combination that we'll see shortly, they'll be part of usually most of the mixes for blood sugar balancing. So the first one, first formula that you want to think of, okay? Alpha science glucose effects. When we look at what's in here, we're going to see some very common themes again, along with the alpha lipoic acid, chromium, uh, chromium, vanadium. We're going to see particular herbs always, okay? So we see those three minerals that we just talked about, Andrew, the alpha lipoic acid antioxidant. We see gemnema. We see bitter melon. And in this one, we got this extra thing of banaba leaf. Okay. So a herbal and a mineral blend to take with your food. Normally the dosage is about one to two capsules 
with each meal, depending on, again, the severity of the situation, the medications that may be used. All right. So if you are with other medication, you're going to lower the uh, dosage. If they're not on any medication, they want to be aggressive with it. Then you're going to go to the higher dosage with the food because we want all the insulin effect to be happening so that the blood sugar is taken up properly, utilized properly, providing more energy, and there's less storage and less circulating around. So generally helps lower blood glucose levels and maintain energy. Well, every single formula we're going to see is for that purpose. But what makes them different is the next thing. So alpha science, alpha lipoic acid, we already talked about that, right? Sensitizing insulin receptors, enhancing glucose uptake to the muscles. Uh, chromium picolinate aids in the uptake of glucose into the cells. Vanadium mimics the insulin. But now these things, and you want to know about bitter, bitter melon and gemnema because, again, you're going to pretty well find them in all the formulas. Okay. Uh, gemnema supports the regeneration and repair of the beta cells of the pancreas. There is your true corrective way. Type 2 diabetes, yes. Type 1, it's not going to do anything for you. They're already not producing anything. All right. So this is actually working on the true mechanism of the problem, which is improper insulin function. That's where gemnema works. Bitter melon, glucose. Uh, lowering properties. So again, that uptake into the cells. And Banaba also does that. So we got two things that are actually helping to take the circulating insulin and along with the chromium, putting it up into the cells for energy. Bilorenko's glypro. So vanadium is in there. Chromium is in there. Now we got, you know, we still have the bitter melon and the gemnema. Cinnamon. And uh, the goat's root are the other things that are different in this formula. So again, helps to maintain normal blood glucose levels. Again, they all will say that, but what makes them different is really the important part as to why you will choose one formula over the other. Knowing the ingredients, knowing what else you can support with a formula. And this is why formulas are wonderful. That's why my course was really what I talk about is formulas, right? Um, the simple stuff, the, you know, the chromium, glucose, uh, chromium, vanadium, alpha lipoic acid, those are the basic things. Anybody can toss those in anywhere, all right? But people, you want to make people's lifestyle easy, okay? And less, less bottles to take from, hopefully less pills to do. This is the beauty of formulas. Now, every formula, as I say, will say the same thing when it's for a particular condition, but they're all, they all have different ingredients to help with something else on top of that. In most cases, that's why you choose one over the other. Okay. So gemnema, as we said, healthy pancreatic cell function. Cinnamon, it's in here because it helps with healthy blue, uh, glucose levels, commonly used for that. But it also helps with uh, cholesterol lowering. It has that extra function of cholesterol lowering. Uh, it's shown to be very, well, uh, very good for that. Bitter melon, we said regulating blood, uh, blood sugar levels. And then we got goat's root, supports healthy insulin response and helps with the adrenals along with that pancreas. So that stress response on the body, high stress affecting the actual release, it's a guy you're supporting that on top of it. So something slightly different than our first formula. So it depends on what they're using it for. And then we got cytomatrix, DB matrix. I think this is the third of the uh, three that we've got uh, to compare with. All right. So DB matrix, again, alpha lipoic acid, chromium, gemnema, bitter melon, banaba, everything we've seen before. So what makes this formula unique and what makes it different? Bilberry extract, lutein, and of course, uh, there's quercetin in there on top of that. So this one here, yes, again, shown to reduce blood sugar levels in diabetics, the general line on these things. But the extra things in here, the bilberry, the lutein, the quercetin, um, and, you know, even the alpha lipoic acid, you know, helps with diabetic associated symptoms to the eyes, glaucoma, cataracts, and also neuropathy. 
So if they actually have weak vision, they've got uh, other issues, uh, focus, sensitivity to light because of, again, a diabetic complication, and the eyes are involved, this is the formula that you want to be looking at. So it's a two-in-one for that purpose. So all the formulas have the basics. It's about what else do they have that you are now looking at that individual in front of you. How can you make their life easier with one bottle versus two, three, four, five, six bottles? Okay. I hope you understand that. It's everything we'll say it's for blood sugar balancing, but they also have a dual function, hopefully. Right. And if we go back, this guy here, no, this was the most basic thing. It's actually one of the strongest things for the most basic thing of balancing blood sugar levels. If that's all there is, nothing else. So at the beginning stages, you can say whatever, you know, and you want to manage it quickly. This is the formula because we don't have anything else associated with it. And we just want to target that one thing, all right, and get them well under control. It's a strong formula for that. But a little bit of adrenal support associated with it too, and a little bit of eye support associated with it, depending on how they progressed along. Okay. So a couple of different things that you may not be familiar with. Supplementation is one thing, but uh, you know I, I also talk about gemotherapy, and I also talk about homeopathy. Um, well, that's my real job, right? So BioLorenco, that we talk about supplements, but we have gemotherapy. We got homeopathics, our key thing, the Dr. Reckwig line. And so I want people to know that these options are there. These, This is a complete learning tool in itself that you got to do to learn about gemotherapy, learn about homeopathy. Uh, but you know, I, I want you, I want to introduce you to it, right? Remember that very first quote out there? expanding your field of vision, knowing what else is out there so that you know that there's other possibilities when you've leveled off, you can now go look at other stuff to help out, right? So gemotherapy is actually really quickly. It's the use of buds and shoots. So it's a botanical medicine using buds and shoots from plants. So springtime collection, when these little buds start to grow on plants, it's collecting those things. And they actually have Everything for that plant to grow to the full, uh, you know, maturity. So whether it's going to be the flower, the root, the stem, the uh, you know, the bark, uh, the leaves, right? The whole genetic makeup is there. It's stem cell therapy, basically. Okay, along with growth hormones that help with, you know, the actual uh, growth of that plant. You're actually feeding yourself all of that. That's what gemotherapy is. It to me is one of the best. Um, rebuilding and restoring forms of supplementation that you can do. And it's very low dosage. The concentrated gemotherapy has, again, it's a botanical, but very low dosage. You're talking five to 10 drops once a day, usually versus a tincture where you're doing, you know, you're doing about 20 to 60 drops in most cases, a couple of times a day. So it's a completely different thing because it's not just an alcohol extraction like most tinctures. This is alcohol, glycerin, and water at the same time. So that's the basics of this thing, and that's why you can pull out so many different things. But this Gemo here, Juggalins uh, Walnut, it's actually English Walnut. Um, it's, we know Walnut for its antimicrobial properties. Uh, really potent antifungal, uh, antiparasitic, antibacterial. But as a Gemo, it does a lot more. It's actually the main remedy for diabetes because it acts to normalize enzymes, insulin production, and secretion of pancreatic juices. So it helps to regulate blood sugar levels, okay, through pancreatic excretion, okay? So helping on that end, but it also helps the gut heal itself, which is also very important for absorption and rebuilding the body that way too, all right? And and when you heal the uh, mucous membranes on the inside, you also affect things on the skin uh, level. So it actually is a good skin remedy when there's issues and inflammation associated with the skin. But the key thing is it's a number one um, diabetic gemo out there. Uh, really important to think about when you really have hit a plateau and you want to actually go deeper and just stir things up a bit and get things going. 
So that's the purpose of GMOs. And I said, it's five drops um, twice a day, maybe three times a day, kind of depends, or maybe 10 drops even once a day, depending on, again, the situation that you're using the GMO for. Um, fiber. Fiber is very important when it comes to um, blood sugar balancing. And most people don't, I think, do enough of it, but it's really important. Most people think fiber, okay, regularity and cholesterol. No, it's also very important for blood sugar balancing. If you take fiber on an empty stomach, you're normally using it for regularity. Okay. You're normally using it for somewhat of a cholesterol control. But if you take fiber with your meals, it causes a time release of the nutrients and the sugar through the system. So you're not creating all these spikes. You're getting a more steady release. So you're not burdening the system. So it depends on how you take the fiber. Now, this one here, Alpha Science, gives you all forms of fiber, soluble and soluble, along with some probiotics and gut healers. So there's so many uses to this fiber, whether you use it in the pill form or the powder form, but so many uses, okay? But it's that if you take it with food, any fiber will slow release without the spikes up and down, okay? Um, all the different properties that are there. And there we see blood glucose control, which of the ingredients actually help with that purpose. Quite a bit of them. All right. Yeah. Your, your fibers are there. Your probiotics are there. There's your cholesterol control, right? Uh, the GI repair stuff going on, anti-inflammatory. So there's a lot, but we got quite a bit for blood sugar control too. And one of the best known fibers for blood sugar balancing is PGX. Um, PGX is actually just glucomannan, oddly enough, okay? So we've got glucomannan right in here, okay? PGX is a very fast release glucomannan, put into MCTs, so it breaks up really quickly and it expands like anything. Okay, so they actually been studying this at the University of Toronto. They studied it for a long time. They came out for diabetes, um, but then they noticed the cholesterol support with it. And then they noticed the weight loss with it, too. And therefore, they put it into weight loss formulas and so on. But the main function was you take it before you eat, right before you eat. OK, and what you normally do is decrease because it expands so quickly in the stomach you decrease the amount of food going in. So calorie restriction. So therefore, there's going to be less sugar in the system to affect the ups and downs. Plus, as it's getting released, it's a time release of the sugar on top of that. So twofold. Calorie restriction, that's, always key. that's actually how it works with weight loss too. Okay, And then on top of that, right, the slow release of everything. So it keeps the blood sugar imbalance really nicely. So if a, ten, if a person has a tendency to overeat at one time, this is the kind of thing you want to give them. So it controls what they're going to eat, right? Because it'll help with weight loss on top of that too. And weight loss is one of the biggest contributing factors to poor uh, blood sugar balancing. So it all kind of goes hand in hand, right? That's what I want you to realize out of all of this. And then I think there's one of the last supplements we got, Bialorenko's Mega B Complex with Vitamin C. You know, yes, it says B Complex, but it is actually a B Complex for diabetics. Very unique. Vitamin C along with the general Bs. But you look at the actual glandulars in here that really support blood sugar balancing and, and digestion on top of that. The liver, the stomach, the pancreas. So the pancreatic enzymes are all in here, the brain, but then also has the chromium. So it is truly a B complex for diabetics. Some antioxidants, some blood sugar balancing, and a lot of glandular uh, support on top of that. So it's a great addition to any of the other, uh, the first three supplements we looked at to support the energy cycle on top of that. Okay. Um, the last one, and that last one actually had some digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes are, are generally important too, because they help 
with the pancreas release of general support and helps with the breakdown of nutrients so you're not creating a load further down. So less load on the body, less less stress on the body, and everything just is, it's absorbed better, you build better, and you get more energy on top of that. So digestive enzymes generally are always a good thing when the whole system is compromised. And when I say the whole system is compromised, the issue is that di- uh, diabetes systematically starts eating away at your body's organs. Systematically. Takes one works through it, basically decreases function, goes through the rest. And that's why we see, hey, cardiovascular issues, uh, circulatory issues, eye issues, everything's involved when it comes to diabetes, right? So it systematically eats away at your organism. So you have to support everything. The force of gentleness is great. This is the power of energetics. Low dose to shift the body to help it on its healing path. Gemmos are like this and homeopathics are like this. All right. And I actually outside of that, and we're not going to talk about essential oils or flower essences all have a low dose that can truly shift the body and create a healing force. All right. Without this mega dosing of anything. And there are times when you really need to use this. So Dr. Reckwig's R40 for diabetic complications. So it's a blend of five homeopathics, all working towards issues associated with diabetes and poor insulin control. So whether it's chronic or acute, it's going to help with all of them. Okay. So what are we looking at? Diabetic complications, anomalies of the blood and glandular systems, weakness and exhaustion of the vital functions anxiety associated with it. So it's going to support in shifting the body to help it move its proper pathway to help with all of that. So symptoms such as diabetic retinopathy, diabetic neurop- uh, neuropathy, all right? Um, so it has homeopathics that will help support, decrease the pain and the irritation and further degradation, you can say, of all of this stuff. It's going to have homeopathics to help with mood stabilization, stress support. Circulation support. That's the beauty of the homeopathics. You put everything together to help support what we're doing. So normally to me, these homeopathics complexes are a great addition to whatever else you're doing to really support the pathways. Gemmo, Optigem. So the last one, we talked about neuropathy and so on. This one here is about the eye health. If you remember, Cytomatrix, DB Matrix, had herbs to help improve vision, a complication of diabetes. OpGem is just working on that vision side of it. So if somebody is having um, you know, lots of uh, eye strain, they have focus issues, their prescription keeps going up or nighttime driving. And, you know, it's just the glare is really bothering them. Computer screen is really bothering them, all this kind of stuff. Or they even have retinal issues associated with or macular degeneration that's happening faster Then you want to support the eyes directly. And OpGem, um, it has a couple of gemmos. Uh, Juniper is working a lot on the liver and the drainage and detox, but Vaxinum, which is bilberry in a gemmo, is improving the microcirculation, which is the true healing side of it on, when it comes to the eyes. Added lutein, which helps with macular degeneration. And silica is very important. Uh, you know, Silica is actually added in here because it helps with the strength and integrity of the collagen structures, which the blood vessels are a collagen structure, really the muscles and the collagen. That's how it allows to contract. So it really pushes circulation along much better into the microcirculation. So you're really going to support the eyes, the microcirculation of that, decrease the fatigue and the degeneration within the eyes. A big complication when it comes to diabetes. Peripheral circulation. That's the next thing. So 63 is about peripheral circulation. So homeopathics to help with improving that. So alleviate circulatory uh, symptoms associated with diabetes, tingling of the fingers and toes, cold hands, cold feet. That's all vascular disturbance. Intermittent claudication, 
cramping within the legs because, you know, there's just stagnant circulation, gangrene, burning pains, spasmodic pains. So homeopathics for every one of those type of symptoms, when it comes to the pain and constriction, that's what we've got, depending on where the constriction is. So overall, in helping improve the circulation and getting rid of all the pain associated with it, so we can get much better flow. Outside of all those things, the most basic thing that you can give anyone is, of course, essential fatty acids. And my favorite has always been krill oil. Uh, there's so many essential fatty acids on the market. All, right? all the fish oils that you can think of, everybody's got 10, 10 different ones. Right, uh, high EPA, high DHA. You can get your cod liver oil. You can get, you know, just vegetarian based DHA. Now you got, you know, vegetarian based algae oil with some EPA, so on. Okay, uh, all of them usually in their triglyceride form. But krill has actually always been my favorite because it's it's in its natural phospholipid form. And being in a phospholipid form, it actually gets through and into the cell much better because that cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. So it actually can become part of and get the nutrients there much faster. Krill to me is the whole food version of oil. Low dose to get maximal impact. So less pills to do. That 500 milligram pill that's in basically all of these, two pills a day will cover you therapeutically. All right which means you have to do about 6,000 milligrams of fish oils. Otherwise you're looking at five, six pills a lot of times. So two pills of krill oil will do the job of cholesterol lowering, blood sugar balancing, improving circulation. And the beauty of it, it also has astaxanthins. And the two that I have up here are high astaxanthins, which is actually one of the best antioxidants you can have. Lots of cell membrane support, getting rid of the dryness, which is the aging process and the cellular death. So helping with the lubrication of the cell, again, working at the cell membrane. So a lot of getting things in and out much easier, getting rid of toxins, getting in some good, good stuff for healing. That's what it's for. And astaxanthins are, you know, they're the best antioxidants that you can provide. So again, reducing inflammation in the system. Uh, Biomed's Astra Krill, I think my favorite overall designs for health is virtually the same thing. They both have the extra six milligrams of astaxanthins along with their fish oil that's in there. So high, do high impact fish oil, basically at a low dosage. You know, the numbers don't compute when it comes to krill. Look, 75 milligrams of EPA, 450 of DHA. If you go sit there for 45 milligrams of DHA, if you go sit there and look at the studies and it says, oh, yeah, you need like three grams of EPA to do something, then you're going to say, geez, how am I going to do all these pills? It's not the case. The high utilization of this, two pills a day usually is more than enough therapeutically. Because of the phospholipid structure, again, I repeat the phospholipid structure, getting right into the cell membrane to do what it needs to do. Um, sorry, the, you know, the one issue with krill is the fact it does actually generally have a strong smell uh, that can turn some people off. It does not come in a liquid format. So if you can't do pills, then you're going to have to go pick a fish oil. Otherwise, you know, and do a teaspoon or tablespoon of that. Uh, that's the only one drawback of it. But otherwise, uh, and if you're allergic to shellfish, of course, you can't do this. Then we can go pick any other oil that's out there. Living beings have a uh, property that dis uh, sorry living beings have a property that distinguishes them from in inanimate matter and that's vital energy. Energy is what we need. Aging is a lack of energy within the cells. Diabetes is an aging process within the body. We need to recharge it. We need the mitochondria to provide us with more energy. And being a degenerating disease progressive, chronic, right? We have to provide a lot of energy for the healing process. So antioxidants, alpha science quench effects, one of my favorite herbal antioxidants, alpha lipoic acid, green tea, pine bark extract, grapeseed extract, red wine, hesperidin, quercetin, lycopene, bilberry, curcumin, lutein, lutein, a lot, a lot of eye support, a lot of microcirculation support and diabetes is poor microcirculation, a lot of it, right? So all the antioxidants for cellular repair from the damage that's happening, that faster aging process, 
that's what quench effects helps with. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, wound healing, macular degeneration, all these issues, and of course, inflammation that sets everything off. Um, two pills a day does one of the best microcirculation support you can do. So any cardiovascular disease of any kind, microcirculation, when we think about the eyes again, right? Um, circulation, macrocirculation to the hands and feet, things like that. Diabetes are prone to, you know, if it's totally uncontrolled, right, they're going to get amputations so on. So we want to improve the circulation as best as you can. And that's what quench effects is all about. CoQ10, the number one, I think, nutrient that you need when it comes to energy. Um, there's two types. There's a ubiquinol that we see on the screen that is the reduced form, the much faster acting and better utilization of the body and the original ubiquinone, which most people will say that this form right here is twice as utilized as the ubiquinone. Um, I think I hear somebody's mic is on. Uh, Adita, your mic is on. If you can, thank you very much. Turn off. All right, um, so uh, CoQ10 helps to produce energy within the mitochondria. Again, helping with cellular repair, antioxidant support, the aging process. And again, diabetes is a repeat again and again and again. It is a faster aging process within the body, and that's why it systematically eats away at the organs. So we need a lot of energy for the body to help repair itself and keep it from dying in a way. Okay. Help those organs and cells from dying. Lots and lots of CoQ10. There's really no limit to CoQ10 outside of your pocketbook. It can get costly, especially in the ubiquinol form, um, but it is crucial uh, for energy production and vitality. And I think I got two more things just so you guys know. Um, designs for health, mitochondrial energy. So again, mitochondrial health, another blend. But this is really all nutrients for mitochondrial support, not just CoQ10. We have CoQ10, creatine. All the B vitamins are energy support within the system. That's why we saw that B complex earlier with the glandulars and so on, right? D ribose, malic acid, carnitine, and creatine, along with the CoQ10, all energy support nutrients for the body, mitochondrial nutrients. Maintain cardiovascular health, support efficient mitochondrial metabolism and energy, which is the ATP production, to increase vitality within the body. So it's supporting the powerhouse of the cells, right? The mitochondria. This is all the nutrients that are needed. If you want to see the pancreas do the better job, the heart do a better job, get rid of the impotence, right? Uh, help with the eye health, everything. Mitochondrial support is needed. Here's what probably one of the best formulas when it comes to mitochondrial health. Can you add extra CoQ10 into the mix? Absolutely, and probably need to, okay? So I I've said time and time again, this aging process of the body, that's what diabetes is, a faster aging process cellular loss, cellular death, wasting away of the body. That actually only leaves us, I think, with one thing, which is protein. The number one deficient nutrient, as far as I'm concerned for most people, is a good source of protein. Protein is the building block of practically everything in your body. Your immunity, your neurotransmitters, that's your mental health, and then all your muscle and energy. MAP, Master Amino Pattern, is quite simply the best product in the world, period. That's really what it is, okay? It is the eight essential amino acids. Essential meaning you have to get them out of your diet. You cannot produce these, but they will go ahead and produce all the other amino acids. Eight essential amino acids the building blocks are practically everything in your body, okay? The highest assimilation we can get. I don't think there's any other, well, there really isn't any other better protein source than what we, what we see on the screen right now, okay? 
when we look at protein, and it doesn't matter if you use whey protein, whether you use a pea-based protein, a rice-based protein, everything like that, or a blend, all they are amino acids. They have generally eight essential amino acids that you see on the screen, plus the rest of them. All right. Whey protein is the most complete, but a lot of people are sensitive to whey. So you can't give it to them. MAP, fermented from legumes, no binders, no fillers of any kind. 100%, 100% digested, 100% absorbed, and 99% utilization. And that's important. Has the highest protein nutritional value and net nitrogen utilization of 99%, which means there is really no wasting with this protein. There's no load on the system, no load on the kidneys. And we haven't even mentioned kidneys because we know that diabetics have also kidney issues. And therefore, they have to watch out the type of protein they can take and how much they can take. There's no load on the kidneys with this. With 99% net utilization, which means virtually all of it does get utilized without any load on the system, without any wasting, right? You're getting the highest utilized product there is. Now, the other key thing about this, and I can go on and on and on about MAP, okay? Because as I said, it's the number one product in the world, period. The building blocks of the body when it comes to muscle, and as chronic conditions take over, muscle loss ha happens. So wasting away starts to happen. They're not as active. So that, again, more muscle mass is lost. Three things, three amino acids are needed to increase lean muscle mass. The branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. All right. Those three are the most crucial amino acids for rebuilding and repairing lean muscle mass, preventing wasting away. This is actually 50%, 5-0% amino acid, uh, branch chain amino acids. It's the highest you'll ever find outside of a pure amino acid, a branch chain amino acid supplement. Whey protein is the next highest at about 17 to 20%. This is 50%. This is why it's a pure anabolic nutrient helps build the body and give it energy and prevent wasting away. So more lean muscle mass, more metabolic support for the body, more healing, right? And there's for, therefore more energy and so on. So really protein, I think has to be one of the key things in the system to prevent further degradation of the body. I think we're near the end here. So it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. This is the basis of learning, okay? You're here because you're, you want to learn more. Uh, this is what all the continuing courses are. It's all about learning, okay? And so continue doing that. You learn the basics in school. You learn, and then you just want to keep going on top of that. Uh, Maria, go ahead. Ask your question, please. Um if you took that supplement for the protein with food, which you're, you're sure you're going to have protein in your food, is that going to cause the food to have a metabolic waste with, um, with this, with this so, supplement? So it, so it depends on it, how much protein you have with that meal. If you already have a lot of protein with that meal, then you don't want to take it with that. All right. You want to take it with either a low protein meal or you want to take it in between meals in that case. Um, for diabetics, I actually tell, tell them to do about two or three pills with each meal. So you actually have a continuous source of good protein. And the other thing about protein, just like fats, more protein and more fat in your meal, along with even more fiber too, right? It becomes a slow release, less spike. So that's why I tell diabetics to do a couple with each meal, but you could do this right after workout, just fine. If they're working out and you want to prevent that further degradation and really get that lean muscle mass built up and that recovery. And one of the times, the other times that the body helps repair, uh, rebuild itself is while it's sleeping. So taking a couple of pills before bed is one of the best repair mechanisms, mechanisms you can do. Okay, Maria. Okay. And that won't cause any binding. No, if you did it that it's way. just pure, simple amino acid. That's all it is. Okay. Thank Nothing you. to worry about. Okay. okay. Uh, Elise, go ahead. Elise? Unmute yourself first, Elise. Sorry. There we go. 
<laughs> yeah, back at the beginning of your lecture, we were talking about insulin resistant diabetes and the cells and the uptake and the not uptake and all that. What is it about the cell that has a problem taking in insulin? No, okay, so the cell is not taking in insulin. So let, let's take go back to quick basics of diabetes and how energy in the cell and insulin works. Insulin is produced from the pancreas yeah. in response to circulating sugar, what you've taken in, right? Yeah. Once it's released, its, it's only purpose is to help utilize that sugar, circulating sugar for uptake into the cell. It's not getting uptaken. The sugar is. It's basically an enzyme, oh, okay, a so cofactor. So you need that insulin release in response to the actual sugar level that's in circulation. So it's, it's the insulin is moving the sugar or should be moving the sugar into the cell for energy. That's its function. Exactly. And okay. So why is it that when you have insulin resistance, mm -hmm. from what I understand, the sugar is not going into the cell. Or is insulin that resistance not? means it, it, it's not utilized properly. That's the next part. All right. It's not utilizing the insulin property. That's insulin resistance. So there's there's a mechanism wrong with the uptake of that sugar and push through with the insulin. Okay. So now we have to look at where's the energy involved. This is why we talk about CoQ10, mitochondrial energy, and all that, because all those other cofactors now come into play to support the body. And it's it's not a simple, oh, let's take the sugar, oh, here's the insulin, boom, and off it goes. There's a lot of other factors in that cell membrane that are involved, right? So that's why then you have to look at all the other stuff. And that's why we talked about all the other stuff. You have to see now where else is the breakdown, okay? And right. just a little further, because when I read a lot about the issue with the cells and the insulin and the blood sugar and all the rest of it, they always say, I continue consistently read that the cell is, is, it has too much fat in it. And that's why it's not taking in the blood sugar. Is this correct? The cell has too much fat in it. Yeah. I really don't know what that means to be, to be honest with you. I don't know. Okay. okay? What, what do they mean by that? The cell membrane is fat at the end of the day. <laughs> All right. So is it, is there too much? See, to me, I would read that as there is too much oxidation in the cell membrane that it's not allowing for things to work properly on the in and out pattern of, of whatever you're trying to do. All right that it's the wrong type of cell membrane. The fluidity isn't there as far as I'm concerned. So if the fluidity isn't there, then you're not going to be able to have everything going through. Um, if somebody has a better answer, please tell me, but that's what I can think of only, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, Aditya, go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, good to hear uh, you talk on this topic. I had a question like uh, you were talking about uh, like uh, people who are suffering from gangrene and already showing symptoms. Uh, can it be reversed? Like that is what I understood. Can it be reversed with the medication like the herbal medication that has been talked of here? Can it be reversed once the person is already having the gangrene and the <laughs> progression of the disease? Yeah, so if you've gone to a point where the cell death has already happened, you can't do anything. If you're at a point where you're just you're starting to feel the tingling in the hands and feet, so you know the circulation has been compromised, sure, there's a whole slew of other things in the cardiovascular section, right, that you can do to help with that, okay? But once the actual cell death has happened, then it's virtually impossible to get that back. So you could keep it from getting worse, but I don't think you're going to stop what's already dead. That's the problem. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, is that Barita? Go ahead. Yeah. Marathi, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I take R40 or R63 with my metformin? Absolutely. No issues whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. No problems whatsoever. That's the beauty of homeopathics. You can take it with all this stuff. It's not going to affect 
uh, in any adverse way, it's actually going to support that. And that's why I said homeopathics, I want people to understand is to take along with and support what you're doing, whether it's medication in that sense, or the supplements we talked about. So no problem whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Let me just finish off here. Um, there's a Jill. Jill Hillhouse does a wonderful course on blood sugar management and clinical practice, a seven week course. I don't know when she's actually going to be starting and she might be doing it. Normally she does it with me in the fall uh, when I do my course, but I think it's going to be right. later on. So I'm going to say, um, um, Baratia, can you turn your mic off, please? Thank you. And so oh, yeah. watch out for this course. Uh, it will tell you everything from A to Z about diabetes on the food and the medication, everything. So it really goes into depth about it. She's written a couple of books on it. So I want you to watch out for this course if you really want to learn about blood sugar balancing. Okay. And that leaves me with my course. Why are we here? To talk about supplementation and clinical practice. As I said, that's what I teach. That's my continuing ed course. I teach a nine-week course starting, I think, in two weeks. Yep, two weeks. Um, very simple course. We just break it down supplementation-wise like we just did today. Uh, do a comparative use of supplementation for various conditions. You got to do a quiz. You got to do an assignment. Really, just show up to class. Everything's good otherwise. Uh, easy stuff. So hopefully you can join me for my continuing ed course on this. This was just one part of it. You can say, um, you know, um, overall, uh, as part of that, the diabetic health, uh, a portion of the diabetic health course that I do, uh, you know, presentation I do. So hopefully you can join me on that. Um, not only will you get this type of knowledge, but I'll do this a couple of other things, uh, too. So I'll leave you with a couple of things there here. I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think, right? That's all it is. Take what you want out of this. Take what you want out of anything you, any continuing ed course, anything you read, whatever it is. Take what you like out of it and leave what you don't like. Okay. But it's just a little seed for you to go further. That's, that's what everyone is trying to teach you. All right. Uh, along with that little bit of knowledge, this is the other kind of things that you get in my course. Um, supplements from about 20 different companies that I work with. All right. So this is the kind of stuff that you get bags of. Actually, you get all of this stuff. Basically, this is what the last class got back in May. All these things from all these companies. Uh, again, uh, thank you for joining me. Much appreciated. Um, well, uh, keep doing your continuing courses. Uh, you know, all the webinars are all really about promoting those courses, uh, excellent courses that are out there, depending on what your interest is. All right. And if you want to learn about supplementation and you want to be prescribing supplementation, which I think for therapeutic purposes, you have to. Food is really important on the maintenance side of it. Uh, but therapeutically, normally you have to do supplementation. Then come join me uh, in my supplementation clinical practice class. All right. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to say everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. And we will end it there.